thank you very much for agreeing to join us this evening. Uh, a warm welcome to the humble Highgate Museum. Um, it could be that some members of our audience are themselves not very, very familiar with, with Christian Huygen. So perhaps I could ask you to begin by uh, saying a few words about him um, and maybe also, as you suggest in your book, explaining why you feel he's a somewhat neglected figure perhaps in the, in the history of science. Uh, yes, of course. So first of all, David, thank you very much for um, inviting me to uh, chat with you in this way this evening. Um, it is. Um, it was at Highgate that I was briefly um, uh, deluded into believing that I could get to grips with physics, and I um, did well at my A levels there, and uh, foolishly went on to continue at university, where it rapidly became uh, uh, much more horrible. Um, so I, I, I really uh, became a chemist after that. So my physics credentials are um, I've been sort of catching up as I go along. Um, but Huygens is a 17th century figure, so the physics is easier back then. Um, he, uh, Huygens, you mentioned your pronunciation of his name, so people in English tend to say Huygens. Um, the Dutch uh, say Huygens, uh, which is why the English don't. And um, uh, my brother reminded me that there was a physics teacher at Highgate School who was French, who called him Wigons. So um, any pronunciation goes really, I think. So he was born in uh, 1629 and died in 1695. And so his life spans um, the sort of glory years of the Dutch uh, golden age of art and uh, culture. And he slips in very neatly between Galileo and Newton and is undoubtedly the most illustrious um, physicist uh, figure between those two. Um, and we've all heard of Galileo and we've all heard of Newton, but um, as you said, very few people really are familiar with Huygens' work. Um, he was an astronomer and a physicist, uh, which meant uh, he worked in mechanics and optics and hydraulics and pneumatics, study the vacuum and so on, and also a mathematician, um, a great geometer. He favored the sort of classical methods of geometry for problem solving um, and a pioneer of the new field of probability. And besides that, he was, he was quite an inventor, a maker of things. He liked toying with um, uh, sort of mechanical objects, making these objects that he sort of devised through physical principles was a big part of his uh, um, uh, career. And it began young in childhood, really, where he sort of would make mechanical toys, for which uh, he was frequently told off by his rather po-faced tutors. Um, and so out of this kind of noodling with um, physical um, devices uh, came his invention of the first accurate pendulum clock. So we're, we're all still dependent in many ways on Huygens' um, technological innovations as well as his uh, scientific breakthroughs. Excellent. Um, I think we'll probably touch later on uh, as to you know why his name isn't maybe so quietly, quite so widely known. Um, but if, if I can perhaps um, change that slightly, um, I held up the, the your book on Thomas Brown a little while ago, and the Economist magazine described that book as not a conventional biography. And I think it's fair to say that your book about uh, Christian Huygens. Uh, isn't necessarily a conventional biography either. In, in particular, for example, you, you do have a lot to say about his father. Would you like to say a, a bit about why you chose to go about things in, in this way? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's a very good reason for that, in that um, Christian's father, Constantine, um, lived uh, almost as long as he did. So I said Christian died in 1695. Uh, his father died. Uh, and in 1687, at the age of 91. So his life almost overlapped entirely with Christian's life. And he was a very influential figure in um, Dutch culture and society. He was a diplomat, uh, very widely traveled, very well connected, um, 
became quite wealthy, um, was close to the royal family or the sort of quasi-royal family, the House of Orange, worked for the, um, the, the stat holders, as the Dutch leaders were called, um, throughout his career. And he offered, he was there to uh, guide his sons, um, several sons, we might talk about them in a minute, but Christian in particular, um, he had you know, immensely valuable contacts for them. He uh, was in a position to provide um, them with sort of funding, in effect, um, scientific funding, um, so that Christian could do what he was best at. Um, and he also led by example. He was, um, I say in the book, what, what the Dutch call a kenner, which um, is sort of like our word connoisseur, although that word seems slightly debased in um, sort of usage these days. So a kenner is someone who knows through um, really close expertise, through doing and, and um, sort of enacting the procedures of uh, what the knowledge area is based on. So Huggins, the father, knew a lot about painting um, and he could paint. You know, he knew how to mix pigments and to apply oil to canvas and, and knew all about the, the relevant arts. And, and this you know, gave him um, a powerful position in terms of he was then able to commission art for the House of Orange and recommend artists. And he, in fact, uh, uh, more or less discovered um, Rembrandt. I mean, not that Rembrandt wouldn't right. have been discovered one way or another, but he, he nevertheless gave Rembrandt his first early commissions. So he was a composer and a, a prolific poet. And he was also very interested in scientific questions. Um, but he was not um, sort of scientifically equipped uh, in the way that Christian, his son, was with a sort of rigorous scientific mind, with the mathematical um, know-how necessary to, to really uh, process problems properly. He was, he was curious and interested um, and aware of current questions, um, but, but not necessarily able to make much um, progress with them. But he also, he did, you know, he, he did nevertheless, among his many rich contacts, were people like uh, Francis Bacon, came to London um, in his diplomatic capacity and he met um, Francis Bacon, as well as a Dutch scientist living in, um, or Dutch engineer inventor living in London at that time, Cornelis Drebbel, who is said to have uh, demonstrated the first submarine under the Thames, um, with, uh, fed by oxygen from some still mysterious means. He, he corresponded on scientific topics with Margaret Cavendish, the sort of um, amazing uh, polymath writer, pioneer, philosopher, um, sort of proto-feminist, um, who wrote some of the first science fiction as well as an autobiography and, and lots of other crazy stuff. And especially um, the father, Huygens, was uh, um, uh, not a friend perhaps, but was useful to René Descartes, who was living in exile in Holland um, during the 1630s. And he was able to facilitate Descartes' work in, in practical ways to do with Descartes' scientific investigations, including in optics, and also helping him publish his uh, Discourse uh, de la Méthode and so on. Yes, I, I have to say that in reading the book, I, I quickly became very impressed with a string of famous names from the history of science who, who appear to be popping up. I'm, I'm just going to, in a sense, break back here. I don't know whether you saw, but the, the, you, we lost your picture there briefly. Um, mm. I, I think it's probably due to the, the, the internet connection. I, I do apologize to our audience. Um, I explained in an email I went out that as we tried to practice for this, um, the quality of the, the video stream from Norfolk was sometimes a bit um, left a bit to be desired, uh, and we still seem to be plagued with the same problems. It's something we haven't been able to do about. But you are still coming through loud and clear at all times, and we've got you back now, so um, okay. so we'll carry on. Um, you've mentioned that the, 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 the uh, Constantine was was a pretty influential figure, and and and, and you've mentioned Rene Descartes. Um, to what extent uh, Christian had had quite a, a I mean a an interesting upbringing in, insofar as he was living, he had many siblings, he was living 
uh, in a household where where some quite famous people were coming and going. Do, do you think this had quite a an, an influence on his his growing up? I'm sure it did. Um, it's not clear whether he actually met Descartes as a, a child. He would have been then. Um, he would have been uh, eight or nine years old, perhaps, when uh, his father was uh, interacting most with Descartes. Um, but he nevertheless later became quite a Cartesian in his um, analytical methods and approach to scientific problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, there's a temptation to believe there's, there's more than just a sort of connection through um, learning and study there. There is, does seem to be something um, closer. Mm -hmm. uh, he mentioned his, his, his family. So he had um, three brothers and um, a sister. And the father, Constantine, sort of used these siblings as they gradually grew older um, to build a kind of network. Uh, a sort of diplomatic network through Europe. He sent them off here and there on sort of grand tours and, and um, uh, diplomatic missions to um, far-flung places right. um, in uh, going to Italy and to Spain and to Poland, uh, Denmark, England and so on. Um, and when they were in these places, they were alert to scientific developments as well, and so they were able to bring Christian news of what, um, for example, the, the astronomer Hevelius was doing in Danzig, um, or what the latest news was um, about uh, telescope innovations from Italy. Um, and they were you know, always kind of mutually helping each other. Um, and that there was a sister as well who was uh, essentially staying at home, making sure they were well fed and, and that Christian was able to look after himself um, when he was uh, living abroad in Paris and elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And so she was taking care of the pastoral side as well. Mm -hmm. And there, there was one brother, wasn't there, um, with, with whom he, he actually did a lot of the astron astronomical work with the telescope, telescope mm -hmm. work? So his older brother, who is uh, confusingly perhaps also called Constantine, like the father, yes. um, is a couple of years older than him. Um, and they spent a lot of time working together, um, grinding the lenses to make their own um, telescopes. And this is a, an extraordinarily demanding task. And I describe it in some detail in the book, but it involves... Um, and calculating the kind of curvature you want on your lens, which is absolutely not trivial if you want to avoid um, chromatic aberration and, and spherical aberration and so on. Mm -hmm. To get the focal length you want, the curve needs to be really, you know, often quite shallow, very um, made of a, you use a sort of large sheet of glass, this is for the objective lens, and you grind out um, the concave side, say, um, using a succession of ever finer, finer grinding powders and um, obviously the, you know, the slightest error, the slightest large grain that gets in there um, can make jeopardise the whole thing and you have to grind away the scratch that that large grain has suddenly put in your glass and carry on. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a hugely time consuming job that demands a certain sort of mentality and patience, a sort of Zen approach almost. Um, yeah. And it's interesting, I have a little digression on this in the book, that Spinoza, the, the philosopher, um, was a, a, lens, a professional lens grinder. And indeed, he ground lenses for telescopes and compared notes with the Huygens brothers on their telescope lenses. Um, but there's, you know, it's tempting to think that there must be some connection between that sort of mindset involved for his day job and the writing of his ethics. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, Constantine and Christian, the two brothers, spent a lot of time grinding their own lenses to build their own telescopes. And gradually these became longer and longer in focal length. Um, and so the telescope he used to observe um, the, the first satellite of Saturn, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, was a 12-foot telescope, 
and then the, the telescope he used to observe the rings of Saturn, or at least the ring of Saturn, that was all they could see at that point, um, was the 23-foot telescope. And later they were even longer telescopes going up to about 200 feet in length. And these were very curious contraptions because you could no longer um, no longer construct a tube of that sort of length. It'd be too floppy and flimsy and impossible to kind of support. And so instead, the objective lens would have to be placed in the air, open air, essentially somewhere 200 feet away from your eyepiece, um, essentially up in a tree or up a mast, um, rigged up there with ropes and so on, and held steady while, so you could line the two lenses up to look through them very tricky operation so these are very challenging you know some forefront science obviously that you know, use the most powerful telescope you can make um so they were pushing the boundaries all the time mm. um you've just mentioned the discovery of, of um saturn's largest moon titan should we should we should we move on to say a bit more about that um of course from um, Highgate's point of view um we, we have another link insofar as professor john zarnecki another the Highgate alumnus was the principal investigator on the um, the, the Huygens um, lander. He had an instrument on the Huygens lander, which detached from the Cassini spacecraft in 2004 and successfully landed on Titan in 2005. Um, so it's nice to think that um, you know several hundred years later, you know Highgate is somehow marginally involved in this. Um, I think you'd like to read out a passage about the discovery of Titan. Is is that correct? Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Um, I can um, just say that Huygens was, I have a sort of uh, afterword in which I say how little Huygens' achievements seem to have been noted. There, there's a little story about a statue that never got put up to Huygens. He was on the 25 Gilder note that no longer circulates and so on. But I'm sure you know, he would have been more delighted by the fact that he was named on the Cassini Huygens lander than, um, than by those sorts of honors, I think. So yes. this is in, um, uh, the sort of early part of his career, just as it's, it's taking off really. He's working simultaneously on um, probability theory and on the, these clocks I mentioned. And so it's everything it's parallel right. all the time. 1655, six, yes. Right. So, in the early spring of 1655, most likely in the garden of the family home on the plain in The Hague, Christian Huygens set up a telescope he had made with his brother Constantine. It comprised a 12-foot tube fitted with plano convex objective lens and a simple eyepiece that gave overall 50-fold magnification and turned it towards Saturn. In the 17th century, Saturn was the remotest known planet in the solar system which was unchanged from the one studied by classical astronomers, except in one important respect. The identification of four moons orbiting Jupiter by Galileo in 1610 raised the possibility that there was more to be learned. Saturn was the new puzzle as its size and brightness appeared to vary in a most unplanet-like way, and it now became the focus of attention for many astronomers. It was perhaps all the incentive the Huygens brothers needed to keep on striving to improve their telescopes. During the frosty nights, the few that were clear, Christian carefully observed the planet's changes, making many sketches, some perhaps done with the assistance of magic lantern projections. On the 25th of March, he detected what seemed to be a satellite as well as another body close to the planet, which he labeled Etoile B. Surprisingly, he did not measure the exact positions of these bodies, but he did take enough readings to conclude that a 12B, which he was unable to find again after a few days break going to cloud cover, was errant. The true satellite, which he observed to lie three minutes of arc away from its parent planet, had a fixed orbital period that he measured to be 15 days, 22 hours and 39 minutes. He continued his observations through April and May in order to confirm that he had indeed identified the first new body in the solar system since Galileo's Medician stars. He communicated his news to the English mathematician John Wallace, 
in a letter mostly concerned with his analysis of geometric curves, referring only in the briefest general terms to his use of the telescope, he adopted the form of an anagram, and then a customary means of disclosing that one had made an important discovery while not yet revealing its exact nature. He formulated his anagram such that it would be virtually impossible to solve by using a quotation from the Roman poet Ovid and wrote it out, <clears throat> wrote it out in clear capitals along with a jumble of leftover letters. Ad movere oculis distantia sidera nostris. And then it goes V, 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 C, 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 R, R, H, N, B, Q, X. Suitably rearranged, these letters decode as Saturno luna sua circunducitur diebus sextecim oris quatuor, which would, whenever Huygens chose to explain it, be enough to establish his priority in discovering this first moon of Saturn, <clears throat> which he now added, having find his earlier measurements, circles its planets, its planet in 16 days and four hours. Although he did not name the moon, it was called Titan by John Herschel more than a century later, Christian was thrilled with his discovery. He picked up his diamond point and along the glass rim of the objective lens through which he had seen it, he scratched the Ovidian part of the anagram, marking forever the lens that had, quote, brought the distant stars to our eyes. And I should just uh, add that I was lucky enough to actually hold this lens. Um, I went to the, the Dutch um, sort of Museum of Scientific History, the Boerhaave Museum in Leiden, um, and they were uh, having a major refurb there at the time, so a lot of the displays weren't actually up, and instead uh, they were in a, 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 a conservation area, and things were being worked on, and so I was able to hold this lens, which was about like a, um, a dessert plate, let's say, about sort of, um, 200 millimeters diameter, and on the edges you could see scratched into it that, uh, that Ovidian um, anagram decoded. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to ask whether the lens still existed, so, so thank you for asking. Are there, are there many sort of Huygens things you can still see, or, or Huygens sites which are worth visiting in, in the Netherlands? There, there are one or two. I mean, there, there are a few of the earliest, or at least early-ish, it's all rather hotly contested clocks that he made, or that right. he had made for him. Um, and there's a lot of um, tension between uh, him and his clockmakers and between clockmakers mutually. So it's a terribly competitive field. So um, it, it's difficult to ascertain dates and authorship exactly, but in the Science Museum in London, there's a, an early Huygens clock made by Samuel Salomon Costa, and uh, in the Bohava Museum in Leiden, there's another one. Right. There are others around as well. Um, and then the main thing that exists, survives from that era, really, is um, the sort of uh, country retreat of Papa Huygens. Um, which is, I mean, barely a country retreat. It's only about four kilometers outside The Hague in a place called Wurburg. Um, right. this, this is his uh, country house called Hofwijk, um, which is a sort of lovely brick moated um, house with a, with a garden laid out in sort of um, according to Vitruvian principles, uh, following the pattern of the human body. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, the Huygens house where um, Christian probably made those observations I was talking about the garden there. Um, that house and garden have gone, um, and they did stand um, next to where the Maritz House Museum in The Hague now is, but it was uh, unfortunately demolished in the 19th century. Right, okay. We'll, we'll come in, in just in a second to, to the, the question of Huygens versus Newton, but um, is, is, is he much better known in the Netherlands than here? I mean, if you if you stop someone in the street and ask them about Christian Huygens, would they would they be able well, to? I should, I should have done that, shouldn't I? I, I never did that. I, I, yeah. I love them, but um, I, I didn't. Um, I did sort of look in a few um, uh, uh, town map indexes and stuff. There are a few 
Huygens streets and a few Huygens schools and a few Huygens laboratories and things scattered here and there. So the, right. the laboratories, one can say, are perhaps named for Christian, but most of the streets of course. Yeah. will be after the father, the poet, the composer, who is better known by most Dutch people than, than the son, I think. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, he's better known than um, there than here, and uh, better known than uh, I would say he's better known than someone like uh, Robert Boyle is here, or Robert mm -hmm. Hook. So you know, I think he does have a threshold. He's perhaps not as famous as Newton. We'll talk about that comparison in a moment, I expect. But uh, yeah. he's you know, he's somewhat known. Yeah, and, and again, before we get on to Newton, I, I must admit I was. You've obviously consulted a, a large number of original sources for this book, which, which are in various languages. And I do get the impression um, from having read the book and also from following you on Twitter that, that you can speak Dutch or you've taught yourself Dutch. I speak a bit in Netherlands, my heel slecht. Um, I, I do not speak Dutch, really. I can read enough to stumble through my necessary secondary sources. Um, right. Most Dutch people, uh, if I try to speak Dutch, immediately tell me to stop uh, <laughs> and uh, burst into their much better English. So I, that's one reason speaking hasn't got far. Um, but I, you know, I, it was necessary to read Dutch for the secondary sources mainly, actually, not the primary sources. Most of the um, Huygens' papers and treatises and correspondence is in French. Um, right. Some of the astronomical and mathematical stuff, especially, will be in Latin because that was the convenient language where all the terminology existed for those classical sciences. Um, but in general, he used the language of the court. You know, he's, he was a diplomat's son. Um, he spent uh, much of his career in Paris, uh, and so conveniently, or somewhat more conveniently, uh, most of his important correspondence. The primary source material was in French. Mm. Yeah, let us then finally turn towards to turn to, to Newton. They, uh, I, I know a little bit about the, I suppose both of the lives and the, the contrasts immediately were were uh, very stark. Um, Christian, you know, grew up in a large family. Um, Isaac Newton was an only child. He never saw his father. In fact, I think his father, first real father, died before he was born. Um, Newton is rumoured never to have seen the sea, but Christian, as you've just alluded to, spent uh, travelled to France, spent a lot of time living in Paris and travelled to London as well. Um, so there are lots of differences between them. Um, could you just say a bit about, uh, maybe, and also there's another passage I think you want to read out about, uh, uh, about Newton, um, uh, about why it is that, that Newton, as you say, was, Huygens was, was eclipsed by Newton ultimately. Well, there were several reasons Huygens was eclipsed by Newton, I think. Chief among them, the fact that Newton, Newton himself to start with, and then Newton's acolytes did so much to sort of build his image um, during his lifetime and after he'd gone. Um, so Newton did his best to sort of extinguish rival claims um, from scientists whose work he had depended on, um, not so much Huygens, but uh, certainly Hooke uh, and Flamsteed, the Astronomer Royal, and people who later he plundered ruthlessly um, and then failed to credit in his, um, in his later work, where he used their data to work out his um, theories. So he, um, and then you know, he became a big national figure, um, uh, and was championed by subsequent generations. And as, as sort of nationalism became more important in the 18th century, he became um, this sort of iconic figure. And in the book, I I'd say a little bit about how the sort of Newton industry grew up of um, busts and statues that people could buy of him and so on. And there was none of this for Huygens at all. So I should just read this little um, bit about 
and the differences and samenesses between the two of them. <clears throat> um, when Newton sought seclusion, Huygens sought connection. Whenever he was sequestered in The Hague, he longed for nothing so much as to be back with his friends in Paris or London. He knew that his scientific work depended on the expert knowledge of colleagues. He maintained a lively correspondence with scholars across Europe and relied on them to be kept apprised of, his latest, of the latest thinking. He worked closely with others on many occasions, making refinements to optical arrangements and conducting mechanical experiments. Eigens' telescopes drew on what Galileo and other Italians had done and were perfected in dialogue with Danish, German, English and Scottish astronomers. His work on the air pump confirmed and furthered the ideas of English and Irish physicists. His mathematical work was stimulated above all by his long engagement with French mathematicians. Through this informal international network, Huygens and his colleagues were more readily able to replicate their experiments and confirm their results and to accelerate the dissemination of their discoveries to the wider world. As the first foreign member of the Royal Society and an effective founder of the French Academy of Sciences, Huygens saw the value of formalizing this dialogue within dedicated institutions. The natural philosophers who comprised the membership of these early academies incubated the modern scientific method, informed by the civility that was the watchword of educated people in the 17th century, and guided by patient interlocutors such as Marin Henry Oldenburg, and Fatio de Dullier. Huygens and his scientific peers learned that it was in general advantageous to talk, to write, and to share and compare results with one another. For most of these scientists, most of the time, their nationality was of little consequence. Indeed, it's remarkable how little the virtually constant wars between the countries most active in science affected this intellectual exchange, even when the subjects under discussion were longitude clocks or telescopes, which might easily be regarded as military secrets. Except for the occasional practical inconvenience of a lost letter, or the border seizure of some strange looking piece of scientific equipment, scientists were generally able to carry on unmolested with their esoteric work. Why does this story matter now? Science depends ever more on international connections and so do our lives. As we peer further out into space and deeper into the heart of matter, the sheer physical dimensions of the telescope arrays and particle accelerators require territory that outruns the capacity of any individual country to accommodate them. The vast numbers of scientists involved in their research teams make internationalism a necessity. This cooperation is essential too in a more down to earth, but no less vital projects, such as minimizing the risk to global public health from infectious diseases, and wrote this before the pandemic, by the way, um, or understanding and reversing the crisis of nature that is increasingly evident from our changing climate and from the gathering pace of extinction of plant and animal species. It requires continental or global organization to coordinate this work. And national academies have now been supplanted, supplemented by international agencies to reflect this. Networks of science have blossomed since they began with a few personal friendships and convenient collaborations in the 17th century. Every step of the journey has demanded patience, tolerance, and willingness to reach out across the divide. Yet how easy it is in moments of tribal wantonness to endanger what has been painstakingly built by figures such as Huygens for the greater good of all. So that's my rant, really. That's the only ranty bit in the book. Right. Well, I must say it's quite a it's quite a relevant rant um, given what's been happening in the past few years. I have to ask: Did you write the sentence about the risk to global health of infectious diseases before we knew about COVID nineteen? Or yes, yes, that was, yeah, all that went to press before uh, for well this year. Yes, quite a while ago. Yes, um, we're moving on. It's, we've been going for a while now, so I, I think I'll not necessarily begin to to wind things up, but but maybe. Um, head towards the end. Um, we've just been talking about Newton and I, wearing another hat, interviewed Sir Martin Rees uh, 
uh, about 10 years ago when he was president of the Royal Society. Um, and we didn't talk about Huygens, I'm afraid, but we did talk about Galileo and Newton. And, and Martin described Galileo as a rather engaging man. Well, Newton wasn't a person you would have wanted to meet because he was solitary and strange when young and vindictive and vain when old and powerful. Would you have wanted to meet Christian Huygens? Uh, yes, I certainly would have wanted to meet him. I mean, I think any biographer will want to meet their subject, um, <laughs> yeah, even if they might not be a congenial uh, bundle of laughs. Um, and I mean, Huygens, I'm not sure he did have a sort of tremendous sense of humour or anything. I didn't detect much of that in in his uh, correspondence and so on. Um, but I think he would be tremendously interesting for the range of his interests, apart from anything else, not just the astronomy and the physics and the mathematics that I've mentioned, but we, we haven't talked about his abilities as a draftsman and an, an artist, um, and as a musician and his ideas about uh, musical theory. Um, and then the other reason I think it would be interesting to have met um, is because of his, his sheer professionalism and his kind of focus mm -hmm. that was really quite quite unusual for um, natural philosophers, scientists, whatever we're calling them, um, from this period where you know, even Newton spent a lot of time working on strange um, uh, theological ideas and alchemy, um, sort of fruitless alchemical explorations. Um, Huygens kept his eye on the ball and worked on you know, actual soluble physical problems and um, it didn't kind of, in fact, avoided wandering off onto these kinds of topics. You know, occasionally he'd be asked because of his sort of family's connections to the um, professional connections with uh, the nobility and so on, if uh, he could um, you know, fix up someone's horoscope and he, he tried to palm those jobs off onto other people. So, so he, he, he was, you know, long before the idea existed, couple of centuries before the idea existed, he was virtually a professional scientist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very interested actually what you said about um, Huygens being a good draftsman. Um, in finding out a bit about Galileo a few years ago, it seemed that his ability to translate what he was seeing through his telescopes in, into drawings, um, obviously no cameras around in those days, um, uh, was, was really significant. No, nobody was anything like as good as, as, as drawing what they, they, they saw as, uh, uh, as he was for, for a couple of decades afterwards, I think. Do you think that having the skills of a draftsman is, is helpful as a, as a scientist? I think it's tremendously helpful. And there are two things to say about this. One is that before cameras, um, I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people could draw really well. Right. Compared to where we stop drawing at the age of 10 or something and say, oh, I can't draw. Um, okay. People could, could draw and practice drawing because they had to, to, to pick things to show other people. Um, mm -hmm. And so retain, often retained a facility. And if mm -hmm. you're a scientist with observations, um, like Anthony van Leeuwenhoek looking down his microscope, you've got to draw what you see in order to tell other people about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is undoubtedly one reason you know, that, that uh, it's a sort of endemic skill that exists in in sort of educated classes. Um, you know, they're not just able to write and speak languages and so on um, and do maths if they're able to do maths, um, but they're very often able to draw. It's part of their skill set in the way that it simply isn't now. Um, and then the other point I make is that there is uh, people talk about scientists being visualizers or not, um, and this is more a discussion in the modern era when um, mathematical methods have become very abstract and complicated. Um, and so yeah, the, the sort of Einstein is a visualizer. And Heisenberg is not a visualizer. It's thought that he sort of disparaged visualization, thought it was misleading and sort of uh, possibly sent you off in, in dangerous sort of metaphorical 
directions. Um, and if you think of Bohr's model of the atom with uh, electrons orbiting around it, you know, that's a helpful model, a visual aid for some purposes, and it's very unhelpful for others. So, you know, there are dangers to visualization, um, but also it's tremendously powerful. Now, Huygens right. was definitely among the visualizers. Um, his, right. I mean, the, the, his work on the ring of Saturn um, is the most you know, compelling demonstration of this. And it brings together both his, uh, uh, his telescope making and then his observational skill at using it um, and his knowledge of mathematical principles and geometrical principles to establish what was the physically possible and likeliest shapes to uh, for these sort of blurs that people were seeing around the planetary body of Saturn to be. Um, and then, you know, the power of the drawings that he produced of the ring in its different phases and so on that explained the way the planet's brightness changed in the sky as the ring tilted dif different ways, um, you know, was the most compelling tool possible to um, explain that planet at a time when, you know, lots of people contested his interpretation of the ring. You know, lots of other people had other ideas crazy ideas um, about what surrounded Saturn and you know they saw one through through their telescopes and Huygens saw what he saw through his and you know it was very hard to reach a resolution um, on this for quite a long time until eventually people accepted Huygens' uh, interpretation. Mm. So I think that's yeah, very important. Good. I, I think at that point here we might move on to some questions. There are there are three which have arrived, and, and one of them bears some relevance to what you've been saying. Um, Anson asks whether we know what um, Christian Huygens thought was, was his greatest achievement, um, and has that, if, if we know that, um, has that stood the test of time? Well, uh, I, I mean, I don't think he says so explicitly. I'd have to kind of go back and compare things a bit. Um, he does sort of claim eureka moments for this, that and the other every now and again, sometimes when things actually don't turn out that great. Um, so he spent a lot of time trying to push his work on the pendulum clock, uh, which you know, was work he achieved in the 1650s, push that forward to devise a workable um, seagoing clock for calculating longitude. And he would have very much liked to crack that problem. I think that was his real um, desideratum. But his, uh, his calling card, if I could put it like that, was certainly um, the ring of Saturn. It can only be that. Right, right. Yeah. Well, Sorry. Still, uh, uh, we know there's more than one ring now, don't we? <laughs> so, yes, you know. we do. They didn't then. So uh, it took Cassini to... to his, his rival, Italian rival, based um, in Paris, like him, uh, who has spent many more hours at the telescope, actually, than Huygens ever did to um, divide the, the ring into two rings. Now, yeah. of course, there are thousands of rings. Yeah. Indeed, yes, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, um, um, well, the clocks briefly there, and, and um, obviously there was a... a, a, a um, there were dealings between Huygens and, and Robert Hooke over, over um, mechanisms for, for clocks. Um, um, Susan asks something about, do you, can you comment on the relationship between the two, between Hooke and, and Huygens? Did they work together? Were they um, at odds with each other? They were very much at odds with each other over an innovation called the spring balance, which is a, a way of controlling, the, you know, regulating the mechanisms mechanism of smaller clocks uh, that don't have a pendulum um, and uh, I mean Hook got into nasty disputes a lot um, including you know, most famously with Newton um, mm -hmm. but this with Huygens was also very ugly um, and sort of ran and ran and was arose out of the, the problem that people hadn't really worked out how to tell somebody when you get a scientific discovery. 
So when I was talking about Huygens announcing his discoveries with these anagrams earlier on, I mean, that is a way of announcing something and keeping it secret all at once. Um, and in this case of the spring balance, Hooke unfortunately um, claimed to have invented this device quite a few years earlier than Huygens came up with his published announcement of it, um, but had no evidence to prove that he had done so. Um, so it was, it, it, you know, that could never be terribly satisfactorily resolved. Um, and it took enormous um, uh, sort of diplomatic effort to kind of stop these scientists um, going to each other's throats, really. Um, a chap called Henry Oldenburg, who was, um, in effect, the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, who kept scientists um, in London and in, in England um, talking to scientists overseas. Um, he was a German immigrant, and he, he served this tremendously important sort of role as a kind of nexus um, between all these people and often um, trying to make them communicate more diplomatically um, with each other. Um, so, I mean, there was a, an occasion with another dispute where Huygens had had some difficulty with Newton, where Oldenburg's cover letter had to warn Huygens before he read Newton's comments that you know, Newton's known for his candor or something, which right. was a a very English bit of understatement he picked up there. Um, so, and he, he had to kind of uh, get into the dispute between Hooke and Huygens as well. So, um, you know, until scientific journals came along with um, sort of refereeing and, and proper priority dating of uh, publications and so on, um, which all happens fairly rapidly after this period. Um, you know, it, it's still quite scrappy and they're still sorting out the ground rules. Thank you for that. And then one final question from, um, from Frank, who asks, did Huygens say anything about theoretical questions about scientific method or the relationship between revealed truth and scientific truth? Um, he didn't say anything explicit about the latter. I mean, I don't think he would have, um, uh, he was interested in, um, well, scientific truth rather than real truth, certainly. Um, but he was happy for scientific truth to be a scientific, very strong probability. Um, right. And he, he recognized that it wasn't always possible to know something certainly. Um, and, and this is you know, it's a complicated issue because it's all bound up with um, the meaning of science and, and the meaning of the word science from before um, the period we're talking about when it meant certain knowledge of what was in the scriptures and so on. Um, so Huygens was, um, you know, perhaps because of his work on probability theory, on, on dice and cards and um, games like that, um, you know, he knew that you could still make progress in life with based on the probable rather than the absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. um, happy for um, his knowledge um, to to be worked with in that way, and and thought others should um, work with that way. And I think that also gave him license, perhaps, to speculate. Um, a bit more broadly than some of his uh, peers might have done. So one of the last things he did in his life was to write a treatise on um, what life might be like on other planets. Mm -hmm. Because of his work on Saturn, he, he, was, he was perhaps the best positioned um, astronomer at that time, this was in the 1690s now, just before his death, um, to offer a kind of a relatively informed speculation of what life might be like on these on other planets, and he did sort of bring into play ideas about how the gravitational fields might vary, how the atmospheres might vary, and so on. I mean, he also um, couldn't sort of leave aside slightly more fantastical ideas, um, like you know they'd have to have instruments like telescopes, like us, and, and so on. So. Uh, you know, the, the sort of humanistic uh, idea of, of what other 
um, beings on other planets might be like was getting in the way, perhaps. And it wasn't a um, no. full scientific exploration, but it was it was uncheckable, so it was only on possible or probable rather than certain knowledge he was ever talking about there. Right. Okay, Hugh, I think we'll begin to, to wind things up there. there. There have been no more questions coming in. Um, of course, there's, there's a lot more that we could talk about, um, a lot more that the questions that could be asked. Um, but I, I, I think I'm, I might just put me back on screen again in, so that you can see the book a bit more clearly. Um, I, I do recommend this book. There is a lot more in it than we've been talking about this evening. It is a, a, a very good read. Um, but I'd like to close, I think.